you know, are there some other, you know, key strengths behind going down this path of, you know, more customization and building your own product? The big key strength is they all become walking, breathing billboards. You're They're right. walking everywhere, uh, advertising for your company. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that's a huge benefit. You know, that comes with um, things to be careful of is that, you know, statistics say over 70% of people feel that the quality of the garment is an extension to the quality of the brand. Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitker. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward and discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is produced by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. Today, we are at the world headquarters of Stars Design Group, and I am joined once again by Brett Schnitger, CEO of Stars Design Group. We're going to be talking today about using apparel as a brand extension. This can be a really wonderful opportunity for companies to build brand loyalty, um, add marketing opportunities, even revenue to their bottom line. We've seen some great successes in there uh, with companies that have started in their, uh, you know, production of another product, totally different of apparel. And then we've seen them really broaden the scope of their customer base and loyalty by bringing apparel in. We also saw during the pandemic, Apparel save companies, restaurants, uh, added things like t-shirts, hats and hoodies to their programs to keep revenue going and kind of foster additional club loyalty amongst their local following. There are a lot of ways to go about this uh, from a product standpoint and from a uh, you know, assortment standpoint. Brett, how do you know, first of all, when the time is right to be looking at apparel as an extension for your brand? Well, I think, you know, when you analyze a business, and we've talked about this on other episodes, that, you know, when people wear apparel for the most part that have logos, um, uh, printed media, things like that on the front, um, and it's got some identifiable association with a brand, then, you know, you've got to know that you're big enough to have a loyal following, uh, somebody that believes and and uh, and likes your brand, and I think that's certainly the very first step in determining um, whether you should walk down that route. So people are having kind of this emotional connection to the brand. There's a they believe in what the company stands for and want to proudly be a part of that club. That's certainly the starting point. There's some really surprising, you know, brands that have. He started in in one category that loyalists really get and have moved dramatically to an apparel brand that is disassociated from the original brand. Fox Racing is one Mm -hmm. of those. So in the outdoor sports area, Fox Racing is really, Fox was originally a shock absorber company. And so loyalists in that industry really understand Fox Mm -hmm. as a shock absorber company. But if you take a look at the industry as a whole that walk in and buy Fox products all the time and you told them, hey, you know, the origination of of this brand particularly, they'd be shocked because they associate (laughs) it as as an outdoor, you know, performance brand. It's it's sort of unrelated, you know. Yeah, I think of, you know, companies like Harley Davidson, for example, you know, it's it's almost as popular as their motorcycles, the the you know desire for their leather jackets and things of that nature. You know, yeah, over really the years, is. companies like them have evolved uh, to a more sophisticated level. You know, moving kind of past a promotional advertising kind of decision when you're initially launching product to developing that as part of the overall brand. You know, let's talk about that, the difference kind of between that ASI market where you're, you know, getting an already produced item, a polo, a hat, a shirt, um, and you're putting your own logo on it versus going into a slightly larger scale production where you're customizing it. What are some of the 
first of all, what are some of the key differences of one approach versus the other? And what are we looking at from an investment standpoint? Is that a significant difference? Um, I think some of it's the timing and the, of the evolution of you moving into apparel. So by taking existing blank products and putting decoration on it, I mean, it's a huge industry in the US. Um, and you can buy smaller quantities, you can react to demand very quickly, um, and you can test different types of products that, that are in stock. When you, when you move to actually creating brands and customized products and things like that, and you would think going offshore would be a wise decision based upon the costing elements of those things today. Um, then you've got different commitment levels. You have larger quantities that you've got to invest. So it would require, I think, somewhat of a maturation of a brand or some initial testing of the waters in smaller quantities, you know, that you can get domestically. The costing sometimes can be much less expensive when you go offshore. Quality can be even more improved. You have more, at least you have more of a, a, um, a handle on your own destination and quality when mm -hmm. you go offshore, I think. Uh, picking specific products, specific qualities, fits that fit your demographic, et cetera, which doesn't as much exist in, you know, ready to made garments that are right. sitting uh, on shelves. So, you know, there's those, those particular things as you move offshore uh, provide a lot more benefit as, as you grow this extension. How do you make decisions about what should be in that initial assortment? Sometimes you just look to the industry in general um, T-shirts, uh, we've been in this space, we have a vertical uh, in the promotional products industry and we've been in that vertical for quite some time. And the industry started doing kind of T-shirts and hoodies and mm -hmm. caps, very basic kind of elements that'll, that, that a lot of people wear mm -hmm. every day. Um, and today it's still a very, very large percentage of those mixes. So as you're taking those steps into um, bringing in apparel f to as an extension to your brand, those three categories make the most sense to start. Mm -hmm. And then understanding your demographic, understanding your unique approach of what your brand represents in your space, you would add other decision-making items, um, outerwear pieces, you know, shirts, et cetera, to help yeah. support that. What do you think are some key benefits? I mean, obviously we, we mentioned building brand loyalty, but you know, are there some other, you know, key strengths behind going down this path of, you know, more customization and building your own product? The big key strength is they all become walking, breathing billboards. You're They're right. walking everywhere, uh, advertising for your company. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's a huge benefit. You know, that comes with um, things to be careful of is that, you know, statistics say over 70% of people feel that the quality of the garment is an extension to the quality of the brand. Right. So if you're if you're thinking, hey, I want that walking, breathing billboard, and you you might skimp on quality to get the best price on a t-shirt, and that quality becomes challenging for the consumer that's wearing it, or visual, visually doesn't look dynamite when other people see those person, you know, the other people wearing it, that can have an impact on on how people view your brand. Right. So, but you know the benefit of having people all over wearing, you know, your name across mm -hmm. their chest, across the back, wherever it may be, across the forehead, um, is a is a pretty strong deal today. Yeah, it's actually pretty good ROI. If you look at the cost of customer acquisition now in an online world, oh, it's, it's cer certainly much more expensive than a cost of a t-shirt in Yeah, if you're kind of looking the cost per impression, yeah. if you will, online versus having someone wear them, that passive impression of having somebody, especially in big cities, walking up and down the streets, you're, it's, it's a fraction of a penny. So apparel per. could actually be a part of your marketing budget. Well, it's certainly marketing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an industry that I think of a lot that's in this space of providing apparel items is, you know, the, the concert circuit, you know, mm -hmm. going to a Smashing Pumpkins concert or Pearl Jam or, you know, any number of them. Everybody's standing in line for the, the shirt. And that is one of those examples where, you know, 
you never know what you're going to get with regards to size. Um, there's inconsistency from one concert to another, from, uh, you know, one show, to, you know, one show to another. And I would think that that's a space that has enough people coming through where, again, quality is, could be really elevated and consistency and fit and all of those things that we take seriously in development of apparel could really improve the whole experience. That's a problem the industry has in general, the inconsistency of sizing. We've kind of talked about that in general. Um, and each each segment of, of these companies and areas, like you mentioned, the music business or, mm -hmm. or all these other verticals that, you know, exist in the business space out there, they all, they all make their own decisions on, on ROI and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, you know, you you go to a concert, you enjoy yourself, you want a you want a memory from that concert. So, the t-shirt biz is a huge is a huge uh, revenue maker in that space. But they've they've never really concentrated on elevating quality in that space right. and looked at SPAC in a lot of ways because the demand is still there. Yeah. So you know, sometimes yeah. I think there is some evolution where certain uh, musicians and 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 groups like that are are looking to extend their product mix because again, you know, statistics say they associate the quality of the garment with the, with the quality of the, you know, the purveyor or the mm -hmm. band or musician or company or whatever. So that's yeah. So you really need definitely to consider absolutely. You really need to make sure you're in alignment on that. You know, if you're a high quality vehicle, if you're a really delicious beer, if you are, you know, whatever the product is, you mm -hmm. want to make sure that your product speaks to the, the same level of your, of your brand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would imagine some other things to consider, you know, a lot of these companies are in a different space. So thinking about distribution methods, um, are you, do you have a setup in which you can sell the goods would be something to be mindful of. Oh, I think most certainly. Um, again, there's a pretty robust organization, few organizations out there in this particular industry, um, ASI and PPIA, that 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 have a large network of distributors that kind of step in and help businesses manage that. Larger businesses are starting that have their own warehouse facilities and have their own bandwidth in terms of managing promotional products and apparel in that space, you know, kind of take that in house as an evolution sometimes. But, you know, that that promotional products industry is 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 pretty mature and in, in that that effort to help businesses build that. You know, in this scenario that we're talking about, we're talking about um, existing companies that have an audience that are established. Um, so often when we speak to new brands, we talk about the time and investment to get off the ground and really start seeing a return on your investment and things of that nature. You know, when you're looking at a, a business like this where, like we're talking about, where they're already established and they're looking to bring apparel in, is it going to be the same kind of you know, three year, two, three year cycle before they start seeing a return? It's interesting because a lot of the decision making in this space is not based upon a necessary ROI on the actual product. They're really looking that this is an extension of the marketing and advertising budget. So if they're breaking even, if they're just sending it out, remember, it's like spending money on a billboard. They're mm -hmm. really looking at the statistics of ROI more in line with marketing and advertising than they are as an extension of a brand. We've certainly seen evolution. You've mentioned a large motorcycle company before uh, in this talk that has evolved into a pure brand and all of that becomes profit internally in addition to marketing and advertising. Right, yeah. It is amazing to think about the the other side of it, it's, you know, having intention behind building apparel that becomes its own, has its own life behind it versus, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that do a fair amount of sales outreach and, 
you know, we'll give away 7,000 hats. <laughs> yeah. You know, that right there is an opportunity to make sure, again, that product aligns with the message you're trying to communicate. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Well, those are all really wonderful things to think about, Brad. And in, in knowing that, you know, in the last 20 some years, this has been a strong vertical uh, of, of stars. Do you have any other points of wisdom to share that might help some businesses consider whether or not the time is right for them or just key considerations to make while they're going down this path? Yeah, I think at the point that they're looking at moving from kind of this in-stock, decorated domestic situation to in a more evolved decision in terms of apparel, you know, thinking about planning because one of the big shifts of mindset in this industry is, look, I can get the in-stock goods and decorate them and get them in a couple of weeks to move to a more apparel model that's being produced overseas, that takes a much longer mm -hmm. time. So there are definite benefits for going that path. You're going to have a much more elevated product in many cases. You're going to have, you know, something that more aligns in terms of actual color matching to your brand, et cetera. Um, but that does take planning in advance, understanding mm -hmm. how you're going to go down that path if it's for a specific event or something, backing that on allowing the time with everything that's going on in the world today, freight being what it is, et cetera, buying products from overseas takes a much longer time than buying it off the shelf. Um, so planning is, is critical, mm -hmm. I think, for sure. That's great advice. Thank you for joining me in this conversation once again, Brett. And don't forget to subscribe to stay apprised of upcoming episodes of Clothing Culture. 